All right, welcome everybody to uh, another episode of Talking Trout. It's Wednesday night, first Wednesday of the month, eight o'clock Central Time. We are here, and uh, uh, Wisconsin Trout Unlimited welcomes you. My name is Mike Kura. I'm the State Council Chair for Wisconsin Trout Unlimited. Um, we just held a State Council meeting over the weekend in Westby, and uh, I had the pleasure of of handing out our Resource Award of Merit to uh, tonight's guest, Jeff Hastings. Um, Jeff has been working on watershed conservation in the Driftless area pretty much his entire professional career. Um, and he's, he's been with uh, TU DARE pretty much since, since the inception of this idea, since it, it started as you know somebody's idea on a cocktail napkin and um, has really been overseeing the growth of that program. So we're re really excited to have Jeff Hastings on tonight. Um, and uh, he's gonna kind of give us an overview of the Driftless, uh, touch on that briefly, and then kind of talk about the history of restoration in the Driftless, you know, what we're doing now, and then what we can expect in the future. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our guest, Jeff Hastings. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, the uh, this presentation really is, a, I usually have a bunch of repeats on my PowerPoint presentations, but this one's pretty gonna be a little bit unique. I kind of went through it kind of really tried to highlight some things that have been working for us in the Driftless, uh, things that if you're not from the Driftless and you're another chapter outside the Driftless, things that you know you might wanna to try to help accelerate uh, some projects in your area. That's, that's really what the whole emphasis is of the Driftless area restoration effort is to try to accelerate uh, stream restoration, the amount of streams uh, that you have in the stream in the uh, Driftless to accelerate the restoration of work. Um, we've been working on this now almost uh, 15 years. Uh, we've, we've kind of got a, a things that work and things that don't work. I work with uh, uh, several other, other conservationists. Uh, Paul Cron, our, our stream restoration specialist, uh, has been with us almost from the get-go. Um, again, you know, we, we, we do some projects ourselves, but really, um, I, I always say we're kind of like the catalyst. We try to accelerate uh, the amount of re restoration work happening in the Driftless. So a lot of times, you know, we're, we're we may be bringing some some funds to the project or some technical expertise, but uh, or maybe not even involved at all. But maybe we we help that chapter understand on how to put together our project. Um, Duke Welter, a lot of you know, has been with us for a long time uh, doing a lot of the outreach, and then uh, most recently we hired uh, Dustin Hoffman. Uh, Dustin Hoffman is not the actor, uh, spelled a little different there, but uh, yeah, we've got Dustin uh, working in uh, Southeast Minnesota. Uh, they've got the uh, Lassard Sams program over there. If you haven't heard of that program or if you fish over there, uh, they've got designated funds, uh, sales tax dollars. Um, we work with John Lancheski, the Minnesota executive director. He, he writes the proposals and uh, TU uh, National kind of upfronts the dollars and I do the reimbursements. I sometimes bring uh, uh, farm bill dollars to, to state dollars, but uh, it's a phenomenal program. Uh, we just uh, finished phase 13, uh, over $20 million, over 70 miles improved just through this program. It's quite a, quite a program. So uh, because it's such a huge program and uh, it's, it's, the money is, is big, uh, we hired this Dustin Hoffman, this young guy, to uh, help us uh, do a lot of the work on the, on the ground over there. And, and keep this program really, really going. We do really quite large projects. I, I would say every project we do is about a, a mile long. Uh, we, we work with a private consultant. They, uh, they do all the engineering and then we hire the contractor. Uh, as you can see, we also, we also recently purchased a drone. And so we've been trying to capture some before and after video of these uh, projects that we're putting together over there. Uh, you can see some, some backwater areas. Mike likes to do uh, non-game habitat, so he's got some backwater areas in there. Uh, and a lot of the typical practices you see with, a, with the uh, large boulders and, and overhead cover and using wood and things like that. We're uh, putting together a bunch of video, and uh, actually I'll talk a bit, little bit about that later, but uh, we've actually started a YouTube channel. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you some of the stuff that we're gonna be putting up on that. Now, one thing you probably didn't know is that the Driftless is part of a national fish habitat uh, partnership. Uh, I think there's like 20 fish habitat partnerships that cover almost all of the nation now. 
And so even if you're not in the drift list, it's a good chance that you're covered by a fish habitat partnership that has money available to do projects. Uh, historically, it hasn't been a, a big, a lot of, uh, hasn't been a lot of dollars. I think uh, in the drift list, typically we do two or three uh, uh, projects. They have to be uh, native fishery. So we're working on with our brook trout and it has to come up with matching dollars. So, you know, so if we have a $40,000 available for a project, they, they got to come up with 40,000 on a match. Um, but that's that's something to think about if you're in the drift list and you're looking to do some uh, brook trout uh, work, we, we have some money that we could use to work with you on that. If you're outside of the drift list, there are partnerships like Fishers and Farmers Partnership uh, that does projects. They, they tend to focus on a lot of uh, farmer, as you can see, Fishers and Farmers working with the farmers, but sometimes they are pure just fish habitat projects. So. Uh, Heidi Keeler out of La Crosse is the coordinator of that, but if you just Google fishers and farmers, you could find out a little bit more about that program and possibly work, you know, some of their dollars into one of your projects. Um, so instead of just showing you pictures of, uh, pat, you know, projects we've done and so forth, I thought, heck, I'm going to show you some video we did. Uh, a lot of you probably fish this uh, stream. This is Weister Creek on the Kickapoo Valley Reserve. This is uh, just before we, we started, the, the DNR started the project. You can see the rocks been hauled in here. Um, you can see some of the massive slumping that occurs every, every spring on the left-hand side. Uh, surprisingly, there, there is silt filled up on the stream, but not, not a lot of, not, lot of silt. Um, water clarity is pretty good, pretty good rubble. Uh, remember this little island here because the next video I'm gonna show is after the project was completed. Um, we actually worked on this project in the Kickapoo Valley Reserve, uh, uh, Paul Cron did uh, back in the 90s, we had some EPA dollars, but we just worked on corners, you know, we didn't do the work in between, and so that this corner here uh, was actually uh, uh, a project uh, that we did, like I said, back in the 90s, and, and uh, banks are a little steeper than what we do today, but it was rock rip wrap, and I think there are some munker structures in here too that are still there, so uh, they didn't touch this part of the, uh, the project. So that's, that's before. And then here's, a, here's, here's the after. Uh, they started right off the, off the bat with a nice vortex weir. If you're not familiar with this practice, it, uh, it, uh, the water comes in and hits at a right angle and, and, and comes into this plunge pool and creates a permanent deep pool. Uh, the DNR does a really good job of trying to incorporate non-game habitat. So you can see that uh, they got this, this back little backwater area right here. It's shallow and amphibians will like it, kind of a refuge for forage fish. The banks have now, are now pulled back. They incorporate a lot of wood into their projects. There's a lot of habitat into this project. If you haven't fished it, uh, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna lose some flies or spinners or something. Here's that uh, island that I was talking about. They, uh, they chose to block this bottom end up here so it creates some slack water in here. And we'll find a lot of forage fish use these areas. They do slightly warm up. Trout don't tend to go in there. So they, so they, they really benefit the uh, forage fish and the amphibians. And then you can see that they, they left that corner go that, uh, that we'd done back in the 90s because it was still stable and uh, uh, it helped cut down on some of the costs. But um, water's a little muddy here. I, I was trying to figure out why that is. And if you look in the background, the, the guys are up above still working on this project when I, when I shot it. So. Um, it, it wasn't after a rain event, it, uh, it, it, there you are working up above. So we're gonna, we're gonna uh, create a, a library, a YouTube library of uh, projects. You know, often uh, we'll have uh, contractors that maybe wanna do a project and never, don't know anything about putting a lunker structure in, or, you know, we could even do it for a chapter if they've never put lunker structures together. You know, we're gonna create some video on start to finish and how to assemble a lunker, so. Uh, I don't know I, if, you, if you're like me, I use YouTube channels for everything. I was just looking at tonight on a YouTube channel on how to put a, a new fuel pump in a, in a Honda Rancher. And sure enough, somebody, somebody's videoed it. So I, I use YouTube all the time. We also got a time, have a time-lapse uh, camera. And we're going to also uh, do a number of videos with that. Uh, this is uh, Mike Leonard. It's true, uh, using a, taking a tree and incorporating it into, a, into the bank. Uh, 
uh, you can see uh, he's putting a rock just at the toe of the, of the, of the, of the uh, bank, and then he's going to cover it with soil. Uh, we're using farm bill dollars as part of the cost of this project. So that guy walking around there with the orange shirt there, that's, that's Paul Cron, uh, making sure that, uh, that not only that uh, this project goes in, uh, it meets the NRCS specifications, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, to get farm bill dollars, it have to have so much rock, has to be such and such slope, uh, has to be compacted and so forth. And so we use these farm bill dollars to help uh, stretch out our projects. So if, uh, we have the landowner sign up for the project, uh, typically it covers 50 to 70% of the cost of the project. And then like the DNR fish habitat crew uses their trout stamp dollars to cover the landowner's share. So now they've got a project that's gonna be four times as big as what it would be if they just used their trout stamp. So, um, and so Paul, uh, it has to, someone has to be certified that it meets the specifications. So Paul can, can do that kind of work. But a local county field office can also do that kind of work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Partners, I mean, this, this, this uh, fish habitat uh, is a partnership. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I, I think the only thing bad about this slide is I'm probably missing 20 or 30 partners that uh, have contributed to projects in the past. Um, you know, a lot of times, a lot of these dollars are often used to cover what, again, what would be the landowner's share of the project. You know, again, using the farm boat dollars, paying for 70% of the project, and then the, the remaining costs, you know, we use a partner's dollars to, to, to cover what would have been the landowner's share. Uh, and so that's what I wanted a little bit to talk to you about. Whether you're in the driftless or out of the driftless, there are what we call farm bill dollars from the Natural Resources Conservation Service that you can use for your project. You know, uh, bank stabilization is a key part of, of all, all of our projects, kind of an expensive part of the project. And we use farm bill dollars that to cover about 70% of the cost of that, of that uh, uh, practice. Uh, it, it's also often referred to as EQIP, uh, Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, and every field office in the uh, state, all 72 counties, I think it's 72 counties, all have a field office and have farm bill dollars available to do conservation work. Um, we've, we've used the farm bill dollars to, uh, as a, a short list on the side, you know, stream crossings, brush removal, fencing. Uh, we've done, our, I've got a non-game habitat guide. And so we use our non-game habitat practices. Um, and it made me think about, you know, when I was putting this together, if you've got a, if a practice outside of the driftless, like maybe up on the northern part where you put brush bundles together, you know, or something like that, or, or maybe you jet in your structures or, or some kind of a habitat practice that maybe isn't currently being funded. I'm on the, I'm on the NRCS State Technical Committee, and I could get those kind of practices into the, sta the standards. So if you work uh, uh, to do one of these projects, you know, it could be partially funded by these farm bill dollars. Now these farm bill dollars go through landowners and they're agricultural landowners. So if you're working on state land or federal land, you can't use these farm bill dollars. But since we have so many easements in the driftless, now over 1400 miles of easements, um, it's not hard to find an easement with a, a, a private landowner on that we can use these farm bill dollars. Now we've been using, we've been really successful in using so many farm bill dollars that uh, uh, we, we started to take notice at the state level that a lot of dollars is going for fish habitat. So I started in the last five years, I've been going after special farm bill dollar programs to supplement uh, the equip dollars that normally comes into the state. Uh, the last one is a little over 9 million. The one before that was about 3 million. So we've got about $12 million through the the, what's called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And these dollars are just used for cold water restoration. So we don't have to compete against waterways or dams or all the other conservation practices that NRCS offers. These dollars are just for cold water restoration in the driftless. Um, I hope to probably sometime this month, I will be doing my annual report for NRCS and I'll be able to tell you how many, how many projects we've done through this program how many habitat practices, how many miles, and all those kind of dollars, but uh, it's, it's very significant. I would say so far through this program, over 100 projects have been 
you know, three fourths of the fund of the project have been funded through this program. So it's been really instrumental in moving the needle forward. Now I said, uh, every field office has a conservation staff that uh, you should be inviting to your, to your uh, chapter meetings, uh, invite them to come out and say, you know, are there, are there farm bill dollars that we could use on our projects? Um, now I jokingly use this picture before I worked for Trout Unlimited, I actually worked for uh, a land and water conservation uh, department for almost 25 years. So I can take some fun at poking at these guys every once in a while. But um, now not every, not every county staff has the, what they call job approval to do this kind of work. So we've been trying to do some field days uh, whenever we're doing a project to get them out and see what's happening and uh, get them excited about doing a project on their own. Or with, a, or, or with a chapter. Actually, this is one of the North chapter projects I think that we, we did down on, on, probably not the blue, it doesn't look like the blue, but I think it was with a North chapter. So uh, the North chapter has really got this down. They work with a local conservation department. They find a farmer where they've got an easement. They have the farmer sign up for the farm bill dollars. Uh, about 70% of the project gets cost through the farm bill program. That farmer turns that dollars over to the the chapter and then the chapter uh, uh, pays what would have been the landowner's share of the project about 30 percent so it's really worked well and it's something we've all talked about in a number of number of times so um i you know i just i'll just take a quick second there mike if anybody's got a question about that uh, i'm going to jump into some other stuff but if, if if i rambled through that too fast i'd be glad to take any questions on that uh, there was one question in the chat box. Somebody was asking about the drones and just wondering if, if there are thoughts about maybe using that for data collection, such as temperature or water clarity or flow. Exactly. Or... Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Mike Miller is going to be, I think, talking at the symposium, but they are, uh, and they are using, um, I think we've got a presentation from Iowa that uh, has partially been funded through the National Fish Habitat Action Program, where they have uh, tried to identify these cold water uh, reservoir or reserves, you know, for brook trout, um, and they're using the drone to for the thermal imaging. Uh, there's uh, people up in La Crosse that uh, are are doing this kind of stuff. So we will probably have some stuff at the uh, symposium. But yes, they are definitely using these drones for more and more things. In fact, we're 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 challenged. Uh, <laughs> we're technically challenged. We just we're just lucky to get some good pictures. <laughs> but there's a lot of opportunities with these. Yeah, that's great to hear. I think uh, I think you're good to go to keep okay. going on with the presentation. You know, uh, uh, priority waters. You're going to be hearing a lot about priority waters in, in the future. Uh, it's part of the national strategic plan. Is for for uh, uh, identify these priority waters. We had a, a great uh, talk after the state council meeting uh, this last weekend. Uh, but uh, here in the Driftless, we you know early on we identified our our, our brook trout, brown trout water. Um, the, in Wisconsin, they, they went a little bit step further and, and uh, they developed the master plan. I don't think they ever uh, totally signed off on it, but they've got a lot of good data uh, on trying to identify these uh, reserves, with these brook trout reserves, even with climate change. You know, where are these pockets that, uh, even with temperatures increasing, where do we think we're going to still have uh, 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 viable brook trout uh, areas? So, if we're going to invest a lot of money on these projects, you know, it makes sense to be looking into the future and, and, and doing it where, you know, where we're going to still have a, a, a brook trout reserve. Um, you know, we, we, uh, Mike talked a little bit about talking to, to legislators, and uh, I reminded him that, you know, if you're talking to legislators or, or your local county board, um, talk about how good these projects are for the local economy. Uh, you know, in the Driftless, we did a, an economic impact in 2008 and 2016 showing that it's over a billion dollars annual, annually. Uh, this is the entire drift list. But uh, I, th I think even outside of the drift list, the DNR has done some studies, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has done some studies, but uh, I think it would be wise to get your hands on some of these economic studies uh, when you're talking to your legislators or your local county uh, offices. Uh, I, you know, I, you can't talk uh, we, anything about the Driftless and some of the events that we've had uh, here in the Driftless. Uh, someone said, you know, did you have a big storm event this year? You know, or when was that last big storm event? Well, it's, it's getting to be uh, somewhere in the Driftless. We're having some large event at least once a year now. 
and uh, and and it's really it's really uh, uh, making us think about how we how we do our work and, and where we do our work. Um, uh, we we've got some headwaters that are, are very problematic. Uh, uh, you know, Tim, uh, Timber Coulee. The, not, Timber Coulee has been really pretty solid, but the tributaries come in Bohemian, Ruins Coulee, uh, Upper Upper uh, Big Green, Big, uh, Big Springs. Uh, below uh, Roqua here on Reeds Creek. Uh, we got narrow valleys, uh, streams that are, you know, uh, uh, high gradient, a lot of bed material moving through. And, and uh, we're going to have to uh, make sure we identify these areas. And uh, we're going to probably come up with a different strategy on how we're going to uh, go in there and do habitat work. Uh, Maybe you fished this stream before. This is a, a picture of a spring coulee just uh, down the road from where I live, looking upstream. Uh, as it is one of those streams. It's it's uh, you can see the valley is quite narrow. It's quite high gradient. You can see a lot of rubble. Uh, after that last event, you get a lot of scouring, uh, and just it just uh, the stream may even shift over to another part of the valley. Um, this is uh, this is this is just up from this bridge where I was taking these these pictures were taken. So, I think this guy was traveling the road at night. That would have been a rude awakening to be driving the road and all of a sudden realize the road wasn't there. But these but these upper reaches, these upper high gradient streams. Uh, like I said, you can see the material that's moving down through them. Uh, and we've lost some of our projects. Uh, these are great great areas. The Great fish fisheries. We don't want to abandon them. Uh, you know, typically these are, are brook trout waters. Um, but uh, after one of these events, the stream is wide. It's braided. Um, it's maybe even moved. Uh, so we're we've had a couple symposiums where we've we've talked about uh, you know what are we going to do now? You know how are we going to identify these areas? Uh, so you know some of the thoughts are you know we're not we're probably not going to put any lunker structures any. Any structures that can be washed out, or you put them in, you know, one part of the stream, and the next thing you know, the stream's on the other side of the valley. So we'll probably just use the material that's in place. Uh, we'll try to probably be more cost-effective, meaning we won't be bringing a lot of rock into into these projects. We'll probably use a lot of existing material there. Try to channelize the stream uh, from a braided stream more to a, a more of a focused uh, a channel, and. Uh, and not spend as much with, a, with the idea that, you know, it could be a year or two years and we'll have another big event. Uh, and it's just not our, our, our uh, stream projects that are not uh, able to handle these large events. Nobody designs for this kind of a, a rainfall event. Uh, we had in that uh, 2018 event, uh, eight large flood control dams that the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, built. Um, and actually, I, I did work. I did work on these dams and maintain these dams when I worked for Vernon County, but they lost eight of them in Monroe County and Vernon County. Uh, NRCS had never lost eight large flood control structures in, in, in an, one event ever, and so they were out here and they're looking at it and are now evaluating, you know, what's the most cost-effective way to still provide flood prevention, but uh, you know, is it are we going to put the dams back? Are we going to do smaller dams? Are we going to do upland treatment? Uh, but they're looking at all those studies and the economic uh, impact that these dams had. But uh, you know, typically, this is what we want to see after a flooding event. Um, you know, you can see that the water came up. You can see the water line came up here and it came back down. This is after a, 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 a pretty good event, but uh, no damage to the stream. Uh, in fact, actually, if you look. Closely, you'll actually see sediment was deposited on these sloping banks, you know, and uh, and we see that a lot in our projects. Uh, when we slope these banks back, uh, they actually act a little bit as a sediment trap and and, and capture this, uh, this sediment. Um, so so there's a lot of lot of lot of work still being done on on trying to identify these areas. And, and trying to figure out what uh, what the game plan is going to be moving forward. Uh, the DNR actually worked on Bohemian Valley uh, this this summer uh, again, and uh, 
I, I think that they they did the same thing. They 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 did put a rock in, but they went with real large rock, and they did a, a, a bang bang up job on really pulling the banks back. Um, so we'll, we'll see. We'll just see because we, we know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have more of these. This was Weister Creek. Uh, it also hit got hit by one of these large events, but uh, it did real well. Uh, as as Timber Cooley did pretty well. You know, it it really. Not a lot of bank erosion. You can see the banks were really sloped well. Uh, the vegetation held up good um, and, and did a really good job. The other, the other thought is that, you know, we're, we're, we may just sit back and, and we may wait till some of these watersheds have some work done on, on some of the upland treatment before uh, we go back there. We've got, here in the Driftless area, we've got over 1400 miles of public access to, to work on. So, uh, we can be a little bit picky about where we where we work. Um, I've been recently working with NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, on, on a new standard design for these upper reaches. Um, not not the banks, not the heavy rock and so forth, but where we'd go in, uh, we would shape the banks back, get the water from a braided scenario back into a, a deeper ch channel, um, and and maybe even plant trees. Uh, that's, that's that's one of the things that we're looking at. Something I. I thought we probably never would say about planting trees in the driftless, but uh, there, it may have some merit. So uh, we're we're all looking at uh, how we can, you know, these projects are expensive, um, taxpayer dollars, our dollars. So we want to we want to do the best we can with, with what we've got. I often get uh, questions about the fishery, you know, and I'm I'm not a fish biologist, uh, but uh, both Minnesota and Wisconsin has done a lot of research. Uh, you know, what happens to the fishery after these large events. And, and for the most part, it looks, it looks pretty good. Uh, I mean, the, it's the, uh, the, uh, the fry, you know, the, 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 uh, the young fish are, are the most threatened by it. The older fish seem to be able to, uh, to hunker down and uh, find structure and, uh, and ride out the storm. And our habitat projects actually will probably uh, are, are very, are very beneficial as far as uh, these big flooding events to allow more habitat for these fish to, to get down and, and get out of the way of these uh, these horrific storms. So for the most part, our fishery seems to be doing pretty good. I uh, want to touch a little bit about the non-game habitat work that we're doing in the Driftless. I think it's pretty unique to the Driftless. Uh, I think it's pretty unique to any projects uh, nationwide, but uh, we have, uh, looked at incorporating habitat for frogs, birds, snakes. Yeah, my, my son would say snakes, come on, dad, you gotta be kidding. But uh, some people want to have incre increase the number of milk snakes, garter snakes, or fox snakes on their property. And we, we can do that when we're doing a project. It can be very cost effective. So we've taken, uh, this is the second uh, edition of our non-game habitat guide. Uh, and uh, it has some practices that we work with herpetologists on to come up with to benefit uh, limiting factors or critical habitat factors for, for, uh, for turtles, fr frogs, and snakes, and things like that. Um, and here, on the right is an example of, of some of the habitat practices that we've put on NRCS format, and now they're eligible for farm bill dollars. So if we have habitat practices outside of the driftless that we're using for our fisheries that uh, we want to use farm bill dollars for, but we don't have them on an NRCS standard, we can, we, can, we can easily develop those standards and get them eligible for farm bill dollars. So uh, bank stabilization is pretty, pretty generic and pretty uh, uh, common throughout the uh, state of Wisconsin. But uh, I think some of our habitat practices, either for fish or non-game, might be something we might want to look at. Um, and I would be glad if, 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 if you are, are interested in doing something like that or, or getting something uh, Funded like that, let me know and I'll work with you to, to make it happen. Um, I think the, the uh, projects are getting more and more natural looking and putting some of this non-game habitat in. Uh, I think we're very cost effective. You know, uh, we can put a little side channel like this in here for the, for the forage fish and the, the non-game species uh, for almost little or no cost. Uh, you know, you know, people talk about in, in the state wildlife action plan about doing stuff for non-game habitat, but it's expensive, you know. But when, if we incorporate this non-game habitat in when we're doing one of our stream projects, 
we've already got the large equipment down there. And to do a little scrape like this or put in a hibernacula uh, that's overwintering habitat for snakes or turtles, you know, we can do it for about a third of the cost than any of anybody else could do if that's what their focus was just to do the non-game habitat. So our practices, so our projects today look, look different than they did even 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, you know, a lot of the plantings that we're doing are, are grasses, but we're incorporating a lot of pollinator plants. In fact, the last couple of years, I've got, I found funding to uh, uh, give pollinator plants to any projects in the driftless. Um, bank stabilization is, hasn't changed much. Overhead cover is, is similar, you know, that we, for the lunker structures, although we're not using as many lunker structures as we used to. Um, but like these inside, this inside point bar, you know, typically that would have all been filled in. But here's an opportunity to create a little bit of slack water that the amphibians will use. Now it could be in a, the next flood event, this whole thing could, could fill in and, and almost be like it, it was non-existent, but it really is uh, to develop something like this or do this kind of work, it's really 20, 30 minutes job with, with an excavator. So uh, it's, it's well worth uh, giving it a try. And then here's our typical vortex. We're creating our, our deep pools um, So I, I'm going to I'm going to jump to a couple other things. Uh, you know we've got a number of water quality problems here in the driftless, um, and we're always looking for ways to engage our volunteers into uh, uh, projects and, and monitoring. A number of the chapters do monitoring of uh, both where they do projects and outside of where they do projects. Uh, so we've come up with a with this called a Wise H2O. It's a, a phone app. And uh, we talked a little bit about this at the state council on Friday, but uh, you're able to do nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, take photos of, uh, of an eroding bank, uh, and it gets recorded on, on, on GPS. So we, we know where that eroding bank is. And uh, if we've got a project, a mile long project, and we've got a couple bad spots we need to come back, it, this will be a great way to help identify those areas. But uh, this is the second year that we've been working with this, this, this phone app. Uh, last year, they, they, they modified it so that both an iPhone and Android phone could be used. Um, uh, Jason was, talk, was talking to Jason a little bit earlier about this. You know, you're, we're challenged in the driftless uh, for, for cell reception sometimes. So uh, the idea is you're supposed to be able to take a, re, a, a test. And when then you get where you do have a phone service, it will download and, and, and record that GPS is the way it's supposed to work. So there's there's some bugs still being worked out of, but uh, um, I, I talked to the uh, our, our, our science team and, and Kent Johnson, who uh, helps us at, at, with the Driftless program. And I think they did a little over 500 samples this uh, uh, last summer. So um, we'll have some reports, and maybe in the future Wisconsin trout, we can kind of show of some of the some of the results that we're we're getting with this this phone app. Uh, you know, uh, our national office is trying to, uh, one of the things that they're trying to promote with our strategic plan is engagement. And this, we feel this will be a great way to help engage our members into uh, uh, doing monitoring. They've got a, this, the uh, website down below is a, uh, a link to the, um, the mobile of phone uh, website, and you can see the recordings and you can see how we're using the data there. I'm gonna jump again at this. Like I said, this is not really smooth transitions there, but uh, I just kind of want to give you an overview of some of the things we've been doing and, and where we're heading in the future. Wisconsin has a uh, nutrient standards, uh, phosphorus standards for municipalities to meet. Uh, the, the, uh, the treatment plants have to meet phosphorus standards. And they can either do that by upgrading their treatment plant, which typically costs millions of dollars, or they can work with landowners in their watershed to do practices that tie up phosphorus. And uh, we've had several good examples. Uh, this one was uh, Bob McKeel, my buddy up in Monroe County, uh, working with the city of Sparta. And uh, they're doing stream restoration work. You tie up the, the phosphorus. I mean, if you look at the erosion, that occurs in some of these streams in the springtime and phosphorus is tied to that soil. So if you tie up that soil, 
then the, the, the treatment plant can get credit for tying up that phosphorus. So it's a lot cheaper for a treatment plant to work with a landowner and do this phosphorus work versus upgrading their treatment plants. You know, and, and frankly, you know, you take some uh, vi small villages like Ontario that, you know, in our county, uh, Lafarge, Reedstown, all of these municipalities are, have to meet these phosphorus standards and it's gonna be almost impossible for them to upgrade their treatment plant. So this, this winter, uh, Paul Cron and myself are going to spend a great deal of time looking at what uh, municipalities are under the scrutiny of having to upgrade their treatment plant. And uh, what we wanna do is contact them and let them know that, uh, you know, if they've got, they may, and we will possibly look at, at what they've got up above in their watershed. And if there's a possibility that we can uh, partner with them on a project, then we'll do so. Uh, I, I, to me, the way this would work is, for example, on Tainer Creek uh, here in Vernon County, uh, if we wanted to tie up some phosphorus credits there, we'd go out there and talk to the farmer. Obviously, they're, they're always about bank stabilization. There's not a landowner that wouldn't want their bank stable in the dripless. We could get that farmer to sign up for, for farm bill dollars. So we'd have the 70% of the cost of the project right there covered. And then we could work with that municipality to cover the landowner's share you know, 30% uh, of the cost of the project and they could get the phosphorus credits. So the treatment plant could, you know, could, could reduce their phosphorus, you know, with pennies compared to dollars that would cost to upgrade a treatment plant. The landowner would get a, a project, 100%, uh, you know, uh, cost, uh, no cost to them. And we'd get a, we'd get a project, you know, uh, totally funded. Um, now I wish I could take credit for this next part, but uh, the way this program works, if you incorporate habitat into your project, you get additional phosphorus credits. So, you know, it, it's to me, it's going to be a real win-win program. We just need to spend some time helping these communities um, uh, work with the local conservation departments and the landowners to, to uh, catch, you know, make this program work. Um, so this is the, you know, I, the cross, I, I thought the cross was going to do this. Uh, the cross county was looking at $33 million upgrade treatment to their treatment plant. And their, their uh, uh, extension agent uh, did a study and figured for about three or $4 million, they could do the same thing working with the streams, but they didn't go with it. The, uh, the engineer of the treatment plant, I had several discussions with him and he said he'd rather manage the treatment plant than manage the, the landowner project. So uh, I, I, I thought what a, what a really missed opportunity. I mean, the cross, you know, what an economic, boost that would be for the local economy there. It would be good for the farmers. It would be good for the, uh, the municipality and reduce costs. But, uh, um, but I, think, I think we're gonna have a, a better bargaining tool on some of these smaller communities. Finally, we have two grant numbers. Yep. Let's see, I must have, I must have. So uh, we are gonna have our symposium if all goes well this, this uh, coming spring in February. Uh, you know, I think we're going to have a couple of good sponsors this year, so we're going to try to keep our costs down to just, you know, whatever we can do to, to pull this thing off. So if, if you're with a chapter and uh, would like to come up and, and, and attend this, uh, this symposium, you, you know, hopefully it'll be a cost, um, won't be very costly to do so. We've got a great uh, cold water riparian uh, management uh, track. I think I've got already about 20 presentations lined up from our biologists and, and uh, universities. And uh, maybe what I can do is, is get that out in the Wisconsin trout, uh, a kind of a preliminary uh, draft agenda so you can see what that's all about. But uh, it'll be first uh, Tuesday and Wednesday in February. Um, this is something that we've done in the past that you know we, we, we started really for the Driftless uh, chapters to learn how to do projects. Uh, but then we expanded it to the rest of the state. Uh, we, we had one set up for last year, this workshop, but we didn't, didn't do it because of COVID. And, uh, and I, uh, frankly, I'm not sure, you know, whether we'll do one again. Uh, our chapters here in the Driftless, you know, seem to be on track on, on, on putting projects together. But uh, uh, Laura Hewitt, uh, seen right here, was our, our Midwest uh, TU representative and about 15 years ago. She she put these workshops together and uh, we, we carried on a number of them where we brought in chapters 
that were putting together projects with chapters that hadn't put projects together. We talked about landowner relations, grant writing, uh, how to use these farm bill dollars, even how to put together a successful work day. So, you know, if, if uh, we get a lot of feedback and maybe I'll somehow I'll try to do a survey to see whether, you know, if there's a need to do more. But uh, uh, when we first started uh, in the Driftless, this was a great way to help build the capacity of our chapters on how to do projects. I think that's it. This happens to be a, a picture of a, of a, a pasture up in, uh, I think it was up on Hay Creek in Minnesota. And the farmer had, there was public access on this, this, this pasture, but the farmer wanted to know you're more than welcome to fish this pasture, but you gotta, you gotta be able to run this pasture, cross this pasture in 3.7 seconds because the bull can do it in 3.8, so. With that, I kind of rambled quite a bit, kind of skipped around quite a bit, but I'd be more than glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. Um, really, really great to see it. It's all, I, for me, it's awesome to see the evolution of the stream restoration work that's happening out in the drift list. It just, you know, when I first got involved with TU, you know, 15, 20 years ago, like TU Dare was just getting, you know, started and off the ground and, and like a lot of this stuff was first being developed. Well, you'd, you folks were doing it at the county level, like long before that. But um, from TU's perspective, we were just kind of green to the whole idea. And now, now it feels like it's a it's a well-oiled machine. So it's really great to see. Um, there were a couple of interesting topics that came up for questions. So I'm going to start. At, um, I'm going to kind of break them into three areas. One's about easements. One's about flooding, and then a couple of miscellaneous questions for the end. So let's start with easements and. Um, the couple of questions. One, how do you think we can better promote easements with landowners? You know, I I, I don't think it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's it's. I think you know, in Wisconsin, I think our easements are an easy sale. You know, uh, the, you know, uh, there. You know, we can fish. We can fish any of these streams. We can get access into the stream. You know, uh, and so you know, a lot of the landowners. You know, if, if, if we're going to do a project on their property, you know, they're more than willing to, to do an easement kind of a thing. And I think that's how a lot of these easements have been sold. Uh, just, just a case in point, uh, up here in Monroe County, uh, Bob McKeel, he's got 85 easements. And uh, all those easements, he got their, their, their county easements, their perpetual easements. And he, I think he, I, maybe he paid $50, may, maybe not. But uh, the idea was that they would do a project on that landowner's property and it wouldn't cost them anything. Um, you know, uh, our state easements, uh, you know, every, every once in a while we'll, we'll notify, uh, uh, you know, the uh, lacrosse office that uh, the landowner is willing to give an easement on a project. And, uh, uh, but I think, and if you, maybe Mike, you know better than I do where we are with easements at the state level, whether the funding is there or, or, or not. Uh, yeah, I think I think the funding's still there through Knowles Nelson stewardship. And I know one of the other follow-up questions was, does the DNR target areas for easements? And I know they have done that in the past. They've specifically targeted certain areas that seem to be kind of lacking in public access. And and they will do periodically, they'll have their fisheries biologists do like letters to all of the landowners that have um, streamside property in a certain area and just kind of introduce the program to them and just kind of leave it open. Like if you would like to have this conversation, feel free to call me. So um, I know the DNR is still doing that. And uh, um, yeah, so it, it, I think there's, you know, we just need to do our part to make sure that those landowners out there who are, are willing to do this know that it's available, you know? Yeah, the DNR has master plans. I mean, so I mean, I think before you would get a landowner too excited about, uh, you know, an easement, it might be something you talk to your local fish biologist. I, I would strongly recommend that. And, and, and they could kind of give you an idea, you know, that whether that's in the master plan or if that's, you know, that, yeah, that would be a great stream. I mean, I, I, I don't doubt that the, uh, the DNR would appreciate, uh, you know, if, if, you know, someone, a TU person knew that landowner, I think that would be a great icebreaker, you know, but uh, I think I would, I would approach the DNR, your local fish biologist first, you know, to see whether that's a, a target stream and what the probability of getting an easement is, uh, a DNR that is a perpetual easement. Yeah, that's a good idea. 
Um, and then somebody else just made the note that like um, when other landowners see what we've done, they come to us. And uh, I think that was, is that Brian from NOR chapter maybe? Um, right. But uh, yeah, just, it, I mean, that's probably the best thing that we can do is keep doing these projects because their neighbors see how well their land holds up in a flood. And then they're like, oh, my, my field looks like it just got destroyed, you know, and like the neighbor's field looks fine. And like, and, and so that's probably the biggest thing that we can do to, to help sign up some more people for, for conservation easements and um, public fishing access easements. So uh, it's just I, keep I doing the work. Yeah. I can't think of are there a project in my career where we did a project on one landowner and it didn't lead to a, you know, one or two other landowners that drive by that and say, how did that happen? You know, kind of a thing. So uh, in, in, in the North chapter down there, they, you know, they've got a huge track record down there of working with landowners down there and, and, and get great landowner relations. They have landowner, landowner uh, 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 field days, you know, where they landowner appreciation days are, you know, they just, in fact, they just had one, I know, a couple of weeks ago. So they, they, they've got, a, they're a well-oiled machine and maybe sometime it would be good to get the, someone from the North chapter to do a presentation on, on how successful they've been doing projects and, and landowner relations and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know the Southern Wisconsin TU chapter here does a, a landowner appreciation dinner um, like once a year too. So doing that is, that kind of thing can go a real long way too. So I wanna shift gears real quickly here and talk about flooding. Um, one of the questions, and I think you kind of answered this in one of the slides, but um, somebody was asking like, what type of vegetation gets planted on those banks after you go in and like reshape them? Well, historically it's been sod, you know, I mean, if you went, if you went back 25 years ago, I mean, it would just be rock riprap all the way to the top of the bank, you know, and we, it would be a two foot over to one foot up kind of a slope kind of a thing. But what we've learned is that the, the flatter we can make those banks, the more we can pull those banks back, is key, is, is the most critical thing we do. And then typically we put rock at the toe of those banks to stabilize them. And then we just put some kind of sod, good sod forming uh, vegetation down uh, uh, on those banks. We've, we've tried working with prairie plants. Uh, I mean, if you, if, you, you know, if you listen to other folks, uh, you know, there's other uh, people preaching prairie plants uh, and we've tried prairies. But uh, on the banks, it's been very tough. They're slow to establish. If, if, you, if, you, if you've ever had a, a prairie planting, you know you either have to mow it or burn it to keep it maintained. Uh, and every time you get a flooding event, you get a whole batch of new seeds. So any good sod forming uh, um, vegetation is typically what we use. Okay. Um, somebody had a question, like how are the bridges holding up? Um, mm you know, with regards to the flooding, we saw the dams come out. I, I know some of the bridges have been taking a beating in your area, right? Right, yeah, yeah. I, you know, that one you just saw on Spring Coulee there, you know, it's not, often the, the bridge seems to be able to hold, you know, but the approaches uh, uh, wash out, you know, and I, a lot of the bridges now are, are purposely a little bit elevated and with the idea that if, the, if it's gonna flood, the water's gonna go around that bridge kind of a thing. So, um, but, uh, yeah, again, those bridges weren't designed for that kind of a, a event. Uh, you know, our, our projects do help. I think when we, we take a lot of those trees out of that repair, that corridor, repairing corridor, um, you get you get some damming effect in front of those bridges, and, and that's when a lot of problems that start to happen. So, but uh, no, the bridges, bridges and roads in general have taken a real beating. Yeah, infrastructure is always an issue when you talk about flooding. So, um, Henry had an interesting question. Um, and I know you kind of touched on it, but I just thought maybe we could go back and see if you could pull out some specific examples. Um, and he was wondering about over time, like how our restoration or how our approach to stream restoration in the area has changed because of these um, flooding events. Um, can, you, can you cite maybe some specific examples of things that we do now differently than maybe 15 or 20 years ago? Well, even, even that Weaster Creek project, uh, you know, uh, when Paul Cron and I worked at the local Vernon County office, we, we typically uh, made our, our, our banks much steeper. We, uh, you know, the, the, the landowner was always concerned about losing crop field, you know, so, so we, we kept the banks really quite steep. Uh, so that you could see even with the DNR, when it came up to that corner, 
they had flattened that down. So I would say that the number one thing that we have, we've discovered or, or realized is that the, the lower you can, the more you can take off those banks, the best, the better. The, the more chance you can connect that stream to the floodplain is, is critical. You know, that one picture I showed on Big Springs there, after the flood event, you can see the water came up. You know, you, you, we always talk about making that connection between the stream and the floodplain. And so it comes up and then it goes back down. Before you had vertical banks and, and you had trees and rock banging both side to side and, and the, the banks would be collapsing. So sloping the banks is probably the number one thing. Uh, we're not using lunkers as much as we used to. Uh, one of the reasons that, you know, it's just labor, they're labor intensive and so forth. But, uh, uh, you know, we can, we're, we're finding we can incorporate wood and some other things that are, are on site uh, as effective and, 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 uh, and still do a good job of increasing the carrying capacity of the streams. I think it's pretty tough to, to say that it's as good as a lunker. I mean, you put three lunkers together on, under a corner, you can, you know, you can have 60 trout under those three lunkers, you know, uh, but, but uh, we, we tend to use more uh, uh, boulders, uh, trees, you know, and stuff like that, that as overhead cover uh, than, than we have in, in the past. Um, and, and part of that is because a lot of this work happens during the week, uh, especially in Minnesota, it happens during the week when we don't have volunteers available to do the work. Um, and, and, and we've got just contractors and contractors don't, you know, they, they, they don't have the equipment or don't have time to mess with that. Uh, we just did do two projects in Minnesota. And I think we put nine, six or nine lunkers in each one and worked with the local chapters. But uh, uh, I would say all, in all, we are getting away from doing a lot of lunker structures in our projects. Um, uh, the other the th other thing is just being more aware of, of where we are in, in, in the uh, watershed. Like I said, those upper reaches are real volatile or real high gradient, a lot of material move moving down through that, uh, that reach. Uh, if you had a lunker structure, it would probably fill up with rock, or next thing you know, the stream is, is, is across the valley. So uh, where, we're, where we're doing the work is we're paying much more attention of, of where we're actually doing the work. Yeah, that's a that's a good segue. Jason had a, had a good question. He was wondering if you had any ideas for chapter work days now that so much of that work is being done by contractors and heavy equipment. Yeah, we we you know uh, one of the one of the uh, strategic goals of TU National is uh, engagement uh, of both the chapters and, and the public. So uh, we you know we we've got a new uh, uh, Jamie. Uh, I can't think of. Uh, is in Michigan is a that's her full time position will be engagement. Um, we're going to possibly take some of Paul's time and, and, and Dustin Hoffman's time in Minnesota and help uh, get the chapters more engaged in these projects. Um, we, you know that was one of the concerns we had with, with the Lassard Sam's program in Minnesota. We had all these millions of dollars to do these projects. We started just do, next thing we know it, it kind of you know there wasn't much for the chapters to do. So you know we've. Couple last couple of years, we've done, uh, you know, uh, uh, styles. You know, uh, Duke uh, worked with chapters to put some styles on some of the projects, which are always going to be needed. Um, but we'll, we'll we'll be looking for more ways to engage the chapters in these projects in the future. Yeah, I think uh, you also kind of touched on the the stream monitoring apps, and I think that's something that we as anglers could certainly get more involved in. Um, you know, it's not going to be your typical, your typical Saturday morning workday that we've put together in the past. But you know, that's something that we can all do while we're out there on the streams is is be doing some of that monitoring work. So, um, I think the whole model for how TU volunteers, you know, protect and and work on the watershed is maybe evolving as well. But um, you know, like Randy, Randy Arnold does the, you know, and, and a number of the chapters still do brush management uh, and, and things like, I tell you, maintenance, 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 maintenance. I mean, we, we go 100 miles an hour forward on doing projects, but we're, we're very seldom looking back and saying, oh my God, you know, look at the, look at the, look at the box elders that have moved into this project since we, you know, and, and, and the fact is that, that it, those box elder trees and stuff like that, that's going to shorten the life of that practice, of that project, you know? So, uh, boy, I, you know, uh, and maybe that's what some of these engagements can do is, 
there's a coordination of these work days. So get out there and, and yeah, and do some maintenance on these projects. Uh, Randy Arnold up in the Captowish chapter, you know, he does a, a bang up job on that. Uh, the steel company just this last year uh, actually contacted me and said that they wanted to give fifteen hundred dollars in steel equipment, chainsaws, and so forth to a chapter each year. Uh, and so uh, we chose uh, Randy Arnold with Captowish. I mean, my God, there I don't know how many box shelters that. That crew was killed, but uh, so we'll be looking at uh, you know uh, two or three, you know the next couple of years we'll be looking to, to to help some chapter with those that equipment. But uh, that would be another way of engaging chapters. And um, you know, I, I, it's just too bad the lunkers. I mean, I think we still may. Well, hopefully, we can we can do the lunkers. I really, I really thought we were you know having the lunker field days. You know, where we get together in the morning, we build the lunkers. We, we had the right equipment. Nobody was, you know, was killing themselves. We'd have a, we'd have a lunch, and then we'd go fishing. I mean, it was a, it was a great uh, building. And in, in a lot of, the, I know a lot of the chapters use those days to actually help build membership, kind of thing. So uh, maybe we can, we can, uh, with these coordinators, we can find time to, to do this kind of thing, and and hopefully bring some of those back. Yeah, definitely. Um, somebody had a question. Jim had a question on on some of the older projects that you come across where maybe the bank. You know, like you said, you had that higher bank. Is there, is there a way to go back in and, and re-slope it? Do you ever like yes. slope it back or is there too much rock in there to make it worth the while of tearing it out? Well, it, it, you know, I guess it's a question of whether it's still working. I mean, like, like you saw in that Weister Creek project, you know, it was still working there on that corner. But uh, uh, for example, uh, a lot of you fish the uh, Upper West Fork, uh, like Paul Hayes property outside the uh, from Bloomingdale up up that stretch there, there's three landowners in there. That's actually a project I did when I worked for Vernon County, and that's that's suffered some damage. So we're gonna go back uh, in the next two or three years, and 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 uh, it'll be it won't be as an expensive project because we don't have to do the whole thing. But we're gonna go back in there, probably pull back some of those banks that uh, were left pretty steep, uh, and make sure there's rock at the toe and things like that, and and uh, and get those projects back into shape. So. Um, that's, that's, got, that's just, we, we need to probably do that on a lot more. I mean, it, it just periodically we need to go back and, and uh, put together a, a series of maybe three landowners and get in there and, and put a project together. Yeah, absolutely. So I got a couple other questions, just kind of miscellaneous stuff. I, I thought we'd run through them real quick and, and you could give short, brief answers if you'd like. Somebody was asking about when we separate like the the brown trout and the brook trout, like what effect that has on like a like the population of tiger trout in there, or and if we even care, or if that's even a thought about um, fisheries management. Do you do you know anywhere does that does anybody you know, manage specifically for tiger trout? I haven't heard of that are, before. Not not managing for tiger trout, but I mean I, the the. Uh, Trying to uh, establish brook trout areas, you know, where you've got brown trout is has been tried to, you know, they've been trying to make, you know, make vortex weirs with great big overfalls, you know, uh, they, you know, stream shocking and so forth, and bringing them out of there. Try to eliminate some of the overhead cover. Uh, these are just some of the things that I hear about each year at the symposium when we bring these biologists together, and uh, I think it's a great chance for, you know. Minnesota to hear what Wisconsin's doing versus what Iowa's doing. It's a great exchange. I, I hope you know you, you can uh, you can make our symposium because there'll be 20 talks from these biologists talking about projects, talking about genetics, talking about you know uh, you know what they're doing for research on this kind of questions like this. And uh, they would be far better in position to answer than I am. You know, but uh, the, the the bottom line from what I hear is. Really, the, the brook trout areas that are good brook, brook trout streams, where it's really the, the cold temperatures, seems to be uh, the most effective way of, of keeping the brown trout out. Now, Nate Anderson, I think, is going to talk about uh, up in, he's got some sandy streams up in his area, and he's had some really good luck trying some stuff that uh, really promote the brook trout versus the brown trout. So uh, it, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a constantly uh, a question that's being asked. As far as the tar tar tiger trout, you know, I know where there are, I've seen tiger trout in some projects, but, you know, uh, I don't know about, I've never heard of anybody trying to manage for tiger trout. They're sure cool yeah. fish. Yeah. Um, can you, real quick, can you remind us when the symposium is? Did you say the it's first the first, week in yeah, February? First and, second, first, first and second of February. It's a Tuesday, Wednesday. 
Okay, um, great. And it'll be a lacrosse. Uh, you know, we've, it, you know, they, they, they kill us on the, the meeting rooms and the meals and all that kind of stuff, but we've been able to do it uh, for less than $100 for the two days. But uh, I'm hoping this year, because there seems to be quite a bit of interest from chapters, that I'm, I'm going to try to maybe find some more sponsors to uh, to reduce the costs, you know, so that we can, you know, you know, ch ch more chapter members can participate. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll put a shameless plug in here. Um, that's a Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you can get ready that weekend. You can come to Oshkosh for our, right. our state council banquet uh, February 5th. That's Saturday. So that'll be a fun trout week for sure. Um, Real quick, are you aware, um, has anybody approached you about the restoration project being planned for Fancy Creek in Richland County? I know our folks, uh, our partners at Wisconsin Wetlands Association have a, um, a, a restoration project there. I, I think it's more wetlands focused than like in-stream habitat focused, but I was just curious if that's come across your plate at all. No, I think I've, I think I've heard a little bit about it, but not, not, not much, no. Okay. Yeah, that might be something we want to follow up with them on. Um, I'm just uh, I just going through the chat here real quick. Um, I think there was something else. Somebody was asking about anything planned for Rulins near the Oakland Road Bridge. I hope I hope somebody's not giving away fishing spots there. <laughs> well, uh, the uh, fish habitat crew, a lot of lacrosse. I mean, it seems like they're they pretty much have the. Uh, First dibs on projects in Timber Cooley system. That, that's that's pretty much they that any work that's been done in the Timber Cooley system, they pretty much do the work. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to be losing uh, uh, Mike Leonard and, and maybe Steve Erickson on that fish habitat crew uh, this coming spring. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. Uh, you know, we've been uh, strong supporters of our habitat crews. You know, trying to show them how to use farm bill dollars and, and just whatever we can. So we, I think that's something that, you know, even as a, at, the, at the state level, we need to constantly be making sure that these habitat crews are strong and, 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 uh, and moving, you know, continue to, to, to thrive. Yeah, that sounds great. And uh, I guess maybe this is probably a good spot to end, but I'll just throw this, Jason, put in the, the comment section in case anybody was interested that there's no fish in Rulins either, so. <laughs> I guess you got to go find a different spot to fish. That's, so. that's always a dead giveaway. You got to come up with something better than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I, in all honesty, though, I mean, it, like you said, Jeff, you're you're in what, Westby? So pretty much anywhere you go, any highway you go, you know, you're crossing water and, and they're all full of trout. So I, yeah. 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 And most landowners are, you know, most landowners are, are, are pretty good about letting you fish. They want to know who's out there kind of a thing. But, uh, uh, I've always had pretty good luck with landowners, and uh, and I, I I thank everybody for you know when you fish here. I mean, it, we've got good relations with mo you know most landowners. Every once in a while, somebody will park in front of a gate or something, but uh, it's it's really important uh, you know uh, that we keep those good landowner relationships going. Yeah, absolutely. So that seems like a good place to to wrap it up for tonight. I just want to thank you again for coming on and, and sharing some of the knowledge that you have of the area and, and the restoration work that you're doing. And, you know, those of us from the volunteer side of, of TU are super excited whenever we get to, you know, work on streams in the Driftless. And so um, we just hope that those volunteer opportunities continue to be there in the future. So We'll continue to work on, on looking for uh, for ways to contribute. And uh, it's really, I'm, I mean, I, I feel like we're just getting started in the drift list. Like there's so much work to do. There's what, 600 streams out there? I mean, yeah. we really just scratched the surface. So yeah, yeah. yeah we're just getting started. Volunteers, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we get kind of busy doing the, you know, what we do with the restoration work and stuff like that, but you know, uh, we're getting a push from national level and it's something we, we know that we should be doing anyway is engaging our volunteers more. So I would say in the future, there, I think we're gonna see more and more opportunities to, for engagement. That sounds great. Well, on that note, we're gonna thank everybody for joining us tonight. And uh, um, I did record this, we'll, we'll get that set up on the YouTube channel if you wanna go back and review anything or if you know somebody who missed it. So, um, with that, thanks for joining us. Have yourselves a great night. And uh, we've, got a, we've got about a week left of, of trout fishing in the inland, inland season. So get out there and get after it, all right? 
Thanks, everybody. Take care.